against hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, and also HIV infection. Now let's change topics again and focus in on zinc for inhibiting coronavirus activity in vitro. So in vitro means like test tube study, basically sometimes using cell cultures. So I'm going to focus in on some of the clinical aspects of using zinc in the prevention and treatment of acute infections. The authors of this study stated increased intracellular zinc concentrations are known to efficiently impair replication of a number of RNA viruses. And as I've said before, coronavirus is an RNA virus. So I'll provide you some of my clinical perspectives. This in vitro study provides mechanistic insight into zinc's ability to inhibit coronavirus replication for people needing, quote, specific evidence that zinc fights coronavirus. They now have it. More generally, zinc deficiency is common in the general population worldwide. Zinc deficiency contributes directly to increased mortality, which is death, from a wide range of infectious diseases. Zinc supplementation is repeatedly shown to reduce mortality from a wide range of infectious diseases. Zinc is necessary for maintenance of barrier defense. Conversely, and obviously therefore, zinc deficiency impairs barrier defense and increases the risk for infectious diseases. So hopefully you remember when I was talking about four parts to my overall antiviral strategy, part number one is targeting the virus specifically. And when I talk about targeting the virus, I'm talking about things that can either kill or neutralize the virus directly or block its entry. And what I just said about zinc is that zinc helps to improve the strength of those barriers so that the viruses cannot enter for cellular replication. Zinc is necessary for production of the thymus gland hormone called thymulin, which itself is necessary for maintenance of various immune functions. Zinc deficiency increases the risk for infectious diseases via immunosuppression, via thymulin insufficiency. So in other words, for the immune system to work properly, it needs to have this hormone called thymulin produced from the thymus gland. In order for the thymus gland to produce thymulin to support immune function, it has to have zinc. If people are zinc deficient, they are virtually by definition immunosuppressed, and that's one of the ways that they're more vulnerable to different types of infection. Also, point number six here, zinc ions have been shown to be directly virucidal against, for example, the rhinovirus, which is another cause of the common cold. Zinc inhibits the NF-kappa B pathway that is commonly hijacked to promote viral replication. Point number eight, zinc provides antioxidant benefits by functioning as a cofactor for enzymes such as superoxide dismutase. Reasonable adult doses during acute infection can be 30 to 50 milligrams per day perhaps higher. Extended supplementation with zinc should be accompanied by supplementation with copper, 2 to 4 milligrams, to avoid zinc-induced copper deficiency, which might result in a paradoxical zinc-induced copper deficiency-mediated immunosuppression. And this is observable clinically via relative or pending neutropenia. So let me see if I could break that down just a little bit for maybe an easier explanation. For those of you who haven't studied laboratory medicine, for example, when people consume zinc supplements, one of the consequences for a relatively higher doses of zinc supplementation, like 30 to 50 milligrams, is that that reduces the efficiency of absorption of copper in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, that could promote a copper deficiency. The consequence of copper deficiency is immunosuppression, and we can see that clinically by looking at a blood test called a complete blood count with differential, which shows us that the neutrophil count, which is a type of white blood cell, starts to decrease as people become progressively more copper deficient. So again, the paradox here is that what could happen is when we use zinc to support immune function, because a lot of people are zinc deficient, if it's not done correctly, people could end up with a copper deficiency that then causes them to be immune impaired. So we need to use the zinc supplementation within a context that ensures adequate intake of copper, usually in the range of two to four milligrams per day. Very briefly here, I'll show you a document from the World Health Organization, one of their publications. This was a book published back in 2004, and I'm going to discuss that on the following slide. So how do we justify the use of zinc in the clinical prevention or treatment of coronavirus infection? Number one, zinc deficiency is common in the global population and increases risk for death, infectious diseases, and other problems, ranging from eczema to mental depression. 
Research conducted during the past 10 to 15 years suggests that zinc deficiency is widespread and affects the health and well-being of populations worldwide. Results of our review, that I'll show you the citation for in just a moment, indicate that zinc deficiency in children less than five years of age increases the risk for the incidence of diarrhea disease by a factor of 1.28, by for increases the risk for pneumonia by a factor of 1.5, and increases the risk for malaria also by, in this case, 1.56. The global prevalence of zinc deficiency was estimated at 31%. And again, zinc deficiency is estimated to cause 176,000 diarrhea deaths, 406,000 pneumonia deaths, and 207,000 malaria deaths. This was published in 2004 by the World Health Organization. And now let's take that data and apply it to adults living in a so-called developed country such as the United States. Here they estimate that 30 to 40 percent of elderly subjects in Detroit, Michigan have mild to moderate zinc deficiency. These patients respond via significant anti-inflammatory cardioprotective benefits to supplementation with zinc at 45 milligrams per day, which is very consistent with the level of supplementation I suggested earlier for adults at 30 to 50 milligrams per day. So here they used 45 milligrams per day in American adults who have an estimated prevalence of 30 to 40 percent for zinc deficiency and they found clinically important benefits. So those patients would have only shown benefit to receiving zinc supplementation if indeed they had been previously zinc deficient. So, so again what I'm showing you here and what you should be able to understand is that zinc deficiency is common worldwide in so-called underdeveloped countries, but it's also common in so-called developed countries. So we know that zinc deficiency impairs barriers, impairs immune function, and promotes the development of various types of infectious diseases. We also see that zinc deficiency is common worldwide and it's obviously easily treatable by the use of nutritional supplements containing zinc. So if we're really going to try to make an effort to prevent and treat these coronavirus infections, we need to include zinc in any reasonable protocol. Conversely, when governments and journals and organizations talk about treating and preventing coronavirus and they refuse to consider nutrition, you know they're not really serious about trying to treat and prevent the illness. What they're trying to do is gain control over the narrative around that condition without being truly effective. Now I'll show you an image of that research itself. Zinc decreases C-reactive protein, which is a marker for inflammation, lipid peroxidation, and inflammatory cytokines in elderly subject. Some of those same inflammatory cytokines are part of the so-called cytokine storm that is an important aspect of the major clinical consequences of these pandemic viral infections. Again, they estimate that 30 to 40 percent of elderly subjects in Detroit, Michigan in the United States have mild to moderate zinc deficiency. These patients respond via significant anti-inflammatory cardioprotective benefits to 45 milligrams per day of zinc. The fact that they respond biochemically and objectively to zinc supplementation is evidence of a pre-existing zinc deficiency. Yes, the exact same deficiency that increases the risk for infections and death. So hopefully everyone understands the implications of that. Now again, zinc does show specific activity against coronavirus, also general activity against a wide range of other viruses. We see that zinc deficiency is common in the global population, including developed nations such as the United States. Zinc deficiency contributes directly to increased mortality and death from a wide range of infectious diseases, and zinc supplementation provides protection. Zinc is necessary, for example, for the maintenance of barrier defense. It's also necessary for the production of the thymus hormone, thymulin, which supports and maintains immune function. Zinc ions are directly virucidal, specifically shown against rhinovirus. Zinc inhibits the NF-kappa B inflammatory pathway and also provides antioxidant benefits. Again, for adults, especially short term, reasonable supplementation is 30 to 50 milligrams per day. You might offset some of the impaired copper absorption with additional copper supplementation at two to four milligrams per day. Now let's talk about selenium. So we just talked about zinc. Now I'm switching gears to talk about a different mineral, in this case, selenium. Well studied, especially in the treatment of HIV infection. In this particular study, 